What's up guys? So today we're talking about how to set up and achieve your goals, which you would think is a super important topic, and it is, but I don't see that much about it on YouTube. So this video is going to be broken up into four different sections. The first is going to be how to set up your goals. The second one is how to select a time frame for those goals. The third is how to write out a training plan or at least a general outline of what you're going to do. And the fourth is going to be how to self assess in are you meeting your goals? So let's start with the first one, the goal. Try to make your goal as specific as possible. I see this all the time. People, you know, they just want to get in shape or they want to lose some weight, but they don't have a very, very specific and achievable goal. If your goal is too general, too broad, and not really very specific, it's going to be basically impossible to achieve it. And you can't even really measure your progress towards that goal. So make it as specific as possible. Also try to make it reasonable. If your current deadlift is 200 kilos, don't make it a goal to deadlift 300 kilos. That doesn't make any sense, and it could take your entire lifetime to achieve that. I would say in terms of strength, 5 to 10% is a reasonable amount. So if you can deadlift 200 kilos, 210 or maybe 220 is going to be a reasonable goal. Also keep in mind, if you're a novice, if you're a beginner, you can take a bigger chunk, but if you're more advanced, the strength gains are just going to not come as easily. Same with muscle. Okay, you're going to get diminishing returns. It's just how the body works. So for me, I'd be happy with two kilos of muscle gain in a whole year. And it becomes very, very difficult to measure progress at these tiny amounts of muscle. I mean, that's like a few grams per day. So and then fat loss is a little bit faster, you can probably lose half a kilo to maybe even up to one kilo per week. Um, as long as you're in the right range, it should be okay. So measure out how much fat you have to lose and then pick a reasonable rate of losing weight. Ultimately, keep in mind, if it's not a number, it's going to be pretty much impossible to track. Having more energy or looking better or feeling better or being healthier, all of these goals, they're not, I'm not saying they're not important, they're important, but they're not measurable. And thus it becomes very, very hard to know if you've actually achieved them or not. Also, keep in mind that while you can have more than one goal, if you have more than five, more than 10, more than 20, it's very easy to go nowhere. So I would say pick a few goals, maybe three goals, five goals, perhaps eight if they're very, very similar. So if they're all strength training goals, you can definitely achieve them all. But if you want to run a marathon, and get stronger and build muscle and get leaner all at the same time, odds are it's just not going to happen. So make sure your goals are reasonable and achievable. Next, pick a time frame. So this could be anywhere from maybe four weeks to up to 20 weeks. I would say most people are going to be around eight to 12 weeks for a training block. This gives you a good amount of time to attack your goals and see progress, but not enough time that you get stale and you know start losing track of your goals. You know, if your goal is like one or two years away, odds are that you're going to want a shorter chunk of time to keep you motivated and keep you heading in the right direction. So it's okay to have grand goals, to have goals that, you know, take a lifetime to achieve, but you also definitely need shorter goals. If you don't have these shorter goals, you, you don't really know where, where you're going. You know, if I want to deadlift 300 kilos in my lifetime, you know, first I have to deadlift 220, then 230, 240, 250, 260, and you're better off breaking everything down into chunks, achieving a goal, reassessing, moving on, and moving up the ladder in that way. You can't just jump to the top of the ladder. It doesn't really work that way. So I would say 8 to 12 weeks is a pretty reasonable time frame. And I would say that 8, 10, or 12 weeks is the ideal amount of time to run a program. It's enough time to see if it's working, to see a lot of progress, to keep motivated, but that eight to 10 to 12 week mark is when you start to accumulate a lot of fatigue and in ideal training circumstances, you should probably deload afterwards. Beginners might not have to deload as much or at all, uh, but if you're more advanced, you're absolutely gonna be accumulating fatigue and you're gonna need to deload at some point. So it makes sense just to break your goals into that same time frame, just for convenience. Next, you're going to have your plan. This isn't going to be a specific plan in this video. Obviously, it's more of a general overview, but your plan should be logical, reasonable, doable, sustainable, flexible, and accessible. So let's start with the first one, logical. If you want to get a stronger bench press, you're obviously going to need to bench press. 
you can't get a stronger bench press by deadlifting. Obviously, you're going to have some accessory exercises, some accessory movements, but your plan needs to be specific. It needs to make logical sense. If someone said to you, like, I want a stronger squat, and then they were only doing split squats as their only movement for legs, that doesn't make any sense. So your plan needs to make logical sense. And the reason I say this is because I see a lot of plans online, these cookie cutter plans, and their goal is fat loss, and then they're doing like a strength building plan. That doesn't really make any sense. It needs to actually apply towards your goals. And this is true if you make your plan yourself or if you get it online. It needs to make sense, it needs to be logical. And if you cannot explain every part of your program, you shouldn't be doing that program. Second, it needs to be reasonable. So this is different than logical. Something can make logical sense, but it's just too much or too little. So if you want to increase strength and you're doing like 20 sets to failure per workout, that is probably not gonna be a very good result. It needs to be moderate. Uh, I know a lot of people like extreme programs, one set to failure program, 20 sets to failure. Well, maybe somewhere in the middle is gonna be optimal. And I would say for most people, moderation is gonna be the way to go. So if you're using some kind of extreme program, it's probably not gonna be optimal. It might look sexy, it might you know, promise amazing results, but often just a bunch of solid, decent, moderately difficult workouts is what is gonna get you the best results. Again, marketing is just prolific in the fitness industry, and it is very, very easy to sell something that sounds amazing, that sounds extreme. If something is just normal, basic, moderate, average, it's gonna be best in a lot of circumstances, but it's not gonna sell very well. Number three, it needs to be doable. Now, I see this all the time. People write a certain exercise into the plan, they can't actually do it, or they don't know how to do it, or they don't have a certain piece of equipment, or they buy a cookie cutter plan online and they can't do half of the exercises because they don't have a gym membership. All of this stuff is really, really important, and this is why custom plans are almost always going to be superior, especially when they're written by a good coach like me. So your plan needs to be not only logical and reasonable, but you need to actually be able to do it. So if you only have three days a week to train, don't do a four or five or six day a week plan. Number four, it needs to be sustainable. You're not just training for one week or two weeks, and eventually you're going to get to the point where you can't recover from as much training as you want to. This is true of most elite athletes. They're going to come to a point where they want to train harder, and yet they are beyond their recovery capacity. And so the limiting factor is going to be recovery. So your training needs to be sustainable. Just because you can do something for a week or even two weeks or a month, that doesn't mean it's going to be ideal in the long run. So deloads can help solve this. But at the same time, if you have an eight week program and you are just trashed by week four, that is not going to be an ideal situation. So this might be avoiding failure. This might be exercise selection. This might be using the correct intensity, the correct percentages, keeping a rep in the tank, whatever it is, make your training sustainable. It needs to be sustainable for optimal long term progress. And number five, it needs to be flexible. So I make most of my plans in a pretty flexible way. Often there are rep ranges. So instead of like three by 10, it might be three by 10 to 15. And even if I write three by 10, if you do 10, 10, nine, or 10, nine, eight, or 10, eight, six, or something like that, as long as you're around the right rep range, it's okay. So don't be too uh, hung up on the numbers. They do matter. But you know if you're just trashed and you're not gonna get that 10th, uh, that set of 10 on the last one, it's just, it is what it is. And there's no point in like grinding through a bunch of reps and getting injured because you were married to a certain rep range. And this might involve missing entire sessions. I've had clients who asked me like, oh, I just feel like under the weather today, should I go and train? And often I'll just say, nope, just push everything back, no worries. If someone is sick, you know, you shouldn't be training, okay? Use your body, use your resources to recover from the illness instead of just piling on more stress. So this is where you can't be, have everything set in stone. You can't write out every single rep, every single set weeks and weeks in advance. And if you do, you need to be able to be flexible enough, at least in your psychology and your mentality to change it, okay? You know, if, if something gives you pain, like let's say you're doing uh, preacher curls, and by week three, you're getting elbow pain. You need to be able to deal with that in a proactive manner. And so that might be changing the rep range, the exercise, it could be something else entirely. 
could be warming up more, but you need to be able to listen to your body and have the flexibility to be able to actually stay healthy and work towards your goals. Finally, your plan needs to be accessible. And so this is gonna be, obviously keeping a training log is gonna be huge. You can't remember every single rep, every single set. It's just not gonna happen. Unless you're some kind of savant, it's just not gonna happen. So keep a training log and write everything down, warm ups, how you felt, as much information as possible. This is almost always gonna be very, very useful information for either yourself to assess how things went or for your coach to assess how things went. If your coach is a good coach, they're gonna be asking for this information and you should be sending it. If they like don't ask for your training log, something's wrong because they're not actually coaching you. They're just like giving you a pep talk every once in a while. It's your, it's your coach's job to actually check this data and make sure everything is optimal. And they need to be able to do this based on the numbers. So you need to be writing stuff down could be Excel, could be on paper, could be in a, a shared folder, something. But you need to have this information written down so that either you can assess it or your coach can assess it. So after you run the eight weeks or the 10 weeks or the 12 weeks or whatever, you need to be able to assess your progress. So this doesn't necessarily mean maxing out on your strength. This doesn't necessarily mean like doing a water cut to see how much weight you can possibly lose. This just means looking at your past few weeks honestly and seeing what went right and what went wrong. I've never had a training cycle where everything went perfectly. There's always some hiccup, there's always some ache and pain, there's like some niggle, something. It's never 100% good. And you can actually learn a lot from the bad as well as from the good. If everything goes perfectly, you can basically just run the same program, assuming your goals haven't changed, the next time. But if everything didn't go perfectly, you need to be looking and seeing what you can change and what you can improve. So if a specific exercise, uh, you feel like it didn't really help you, or if you should add something or replace something, this is really, really important, actionable information. One important thing to realize is that there are dozens of variables. You know, if you're training for a deadlift, for instance, um, it's going to be your fatigue, it's going to be your technique, it's going to be your sleep, your diet. There are dozens of variables and trying to find out what went right or what went wrong is going to be very, very difficult. In all honesty, a lot of the times half goes right and half goes wrong and sometimes you don't even know. Sometimes you think, oh, this accessory was amazing and then you do the same thing next time with the same accessory and you don't get the same results. So this doesn't mean you need to change everything constantly always. This isn't CrossFit. But you need to be able to try to tease out the consistency, the constants in what is actually working for you. So if you always get really good results from deadlifts when you are doing your back extensions, maybe it's the back extensions. You still don't know. If you're always doing back extensions, you don't actually know if it's the back extensions or something else. But if you know you do back extensions and everything is going well, and then you stop doing back extensions and you don't change anything else, then your deadlift starts to go down or or, or it uh, plateaus. Well, then it's probably the back extensions. But you still don't know for sure. You still don't know 100% because it could be something else. Again, there's dozens of variables, so it can be really, really hard to check. And this is actually one of the greatest benefits of breaking your training up into cycles because you have, uh, oh, look, this eight-week chunk, and I did really, really well. What did I do during that eight-week chunk? Then the next training cycle, maybe it doesn't go so well. Oh, look, I was more stressed, or I didn't eat, a, eat enough food, or I didn't sleep enough, or I switched out this really good accessory. And this gives you actionable information. But if you don't have those chunks, if you don't have that eight week block and everything is just thrown together like most people do their training, well, it becomes really, really hard to assess. Even if you keep a training log, you know, how do you actually know when the phases start if there's no phases at all? And thus it becomes really, really hard to actually check what is impacting your progress in a positive or negative way. So to recap, set a goal, whether it's strength or size or muscle or fat loss or whatever, uh, have it as specific as possible, try to make it actionable, try to make it finite, try to have it numeric, then set a specific time. It could be eight weeks, 12 weeks, could be up to 20 weeks, maybe as short as four weeks, it doesn't matter. 
uh, I would say around 10 weeks is going to be optimal. Have a plan, have it be logical, reasonable, doable, sustainable, flexible, and assessable. And then at the end, assess the plan and try to find out what was good and what was bad. There's almost always going to be some good and some bad. Try to tease out those factors and find out what actually made a difference. And that is it for this video. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications as well, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.